you, darling. I love you, honey. You're precious. We interrupt the story at verse 23. Matthew 26, 23. Jesus said, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The betrayer was a close acquaintance, supposed to be a friend. And this fact heightened the enormity of the betrayal. It's something about this kind of treachery that just rankles us. If you go to Venice, you must visit the palace there. And when you go to the palace of Venice, you will see the portraits of the 120 magistrates who have ruled Venice for the last thousand years. 120 portraits in the palace at Venice. They're all there except magistrate number 55. The portrait of number 55 has been removed. And over the blank space on the wall, they have painted a black shroud. And the shroud says, This is the space reserved for Mario Faliero, beheaded for his crimes. He was the one who tried to betray Venice. He tried to set up a dictatorship. He was spoiled, and he was beheaded in 1355. And so there it hangs, portrait number 55, just a black shroud with words on it. It is riveting. Anytime you go to the palace at Venice, the longest line will be in front of number 55. Because there's something about betrayal that just rankles us. Shakespeare, the greatest of us all, he drove this home in his play, Julius Caesar. He has Mark Antony saying about Julius after Caesar had been assassinated by Brutus, his best friend, and all the senators of Rome. It is Antony who takes up the cause, and he says in his speech, Julius Caesar dearly loved Brutus. Brutus cut was the unkindest of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, in gratitude, more strong than traitor's arms quite vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart, and in his mantle muffling up his face, great Caesar fell. And there are some of you in the room You've been betrayed by loved ones. You have a brother or sister who won't contact you. You have a child you're not talking to. You have a parent maybe you're estranged from. You have some old friend that something happened and divided the two of you. And maybe you've tried and done what you can. I would remind you that our Lord Jesus lived a perfect, holy, wonderful life. For three years, Judas Iscariot lived with him. Walk with the most beautiful human who has ever lived and yet betrayed him. Now, if you've done wrong, you should try to make amends every month or so, maybe every two months. You ought to maybe send a card, maybe try to make a call, try to do something. But you don't necessarily have to carry the full blame for that. There are two things that counselors really dread. One is when someone comes in and says, it's all the other person's fault. The other thing a counselor dreads is when somebody comes in and says, it's all my fault. Because life is more complicated than that. It is complex. And so if you've borne some burden for a long time, you feel you're to blame and you try to carry that guilt all the time, everywhere, come to grips with it. Lay it down somewhere. Do what you can. Try to reestablish a relationship, but then set it aside. Even our master, who lived a perfect life, was betrayed. Now, verse 24. Jesus is still speaking. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. Isn't that interesting? Jesus felt he was walking according to a Bible-directed plan. He knew the outcome. 
And so he's acting like he's uh, just at a normal time. He's calm and he's in charge. He is so poor, now don't, care, don't miss this. He is so poor, he had to borrow a donkey, borrow a room for the supper, borrow, borrow a garden to pray in, and borrow a tomb to be buried in. And yet the next day, he knows he's going to pay the largest debt that has ever been paid in the history of the world. Poor, yet about to pay the biggest debt ever. He knew, and he was calm. He knew the next day he was going to bear hell in his body. He knew he was going to take the anguish in himself, but tonight, he's calm. Tomorrow, the room full of his friends, they will forsake him, except for John. But tonight, he's friendly. There was something about Jesus knowing that his path was directed by the Lord that made him soft, that made him easy to, to deal with others, to be kind, to be compassionate. When you get angry with God, now listen to me and listen very closely. Now you listen to me. If you ever get mad at God, you will end up mad at the whole world. It will change everything about you. But if you can always believe in your suffering or any trouble that you're going through, if you can always believe that God, who loves you more than anybody else loves you, that God somehow is in this, if not causing it, directing it, guiding it, drawing the lines with which in life will be lived, if you understand that, you can stay soft like Jesus stayed soft. He knew his father loved him. He knew the father cared about him. And so he is walking through this knowing that he is loved and he can be calm and kind in a terrible situation because he knows the father is loving him and guiding him through the path. I one time knew a man who served God. He was a preacher. And then his three children grew up and abandoned the faith. And then he got a disease that ate his body up, and for years he died slowly. Had to go to a home. And the family finally asked that no one ever come visit him. Because he was so angry at God and angry at the world, they were embarrassed. You see, once he got mad at God, he was mad at the whole world. He's mad at everybody. So Jesus is successful on this night because he knows that even though the worst thing that ever happened to a human being is going to happen to him the next day when hell enters his body, he who knew no sin became sin. Because he knows the Father is in it, because he knows love directs and guides, he has peace, and he's okay. All right, now, back to verse 24 again. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man had he not been born. Now, this for sure kills the doctrine of universalism. Universalism is the belief that everybody will be ultimately saved. Uh, Jesus obviously killed that doctrine right here. If Judas would have ended up in heaven someday, somehow, there'd be no need to say it'd be better if he'd never been born because heaven would make anything else worth it. Now, what I'm getting ready to tell you is some pretty heavy stuff. Now, I don't go deep very often. You know that. I'm a practical, everyday, hands-on, living the Christian life preacher. But every once in a while, you have to go deep. And we're going to go deep for just a few minutes. And when I go deep, you have to listen to every word. Because if you miss a word, you might miss a very important teaching. And what we're getting ready to do is talk about something that's very heavy. Judas committed what the Old Testament calls the sin of the high hand. The Old Testament talks about a sin where you clench your fist in the face of God and you say to him, I'm going to do what I want to do no matter what you think. It's called the sin of the high hand. And the Old Testament says that the person who does anything with the high hand reviles the Lord. I want you to beware the brazen sin of the high hand. A sin of the high hand is where one 
listens to the warnings, knows that the people who are talking to him love him or her, but they trample on that love. They bully their way through. They're going to do what they want to do. It's bad enough to stumble into sin. You're going to spend your whole life stumbling into sin. You are weak and you have a sin nature. And you're going to stumble. You're going to run up against things and you're just going to give in. That's just the way it is. You're going to yield to temptations. But the worst sins are the cold, calculated, callous ones where you deliberate. For in cold blood, you think in advance of what you're going to do. It is an evil of extra dark dye when you can see a sin totally laid out. You see the sin for what it really is. You know the sin is going to break the heart of people you love. You know the sin is going to break the heart of God. And yet you are not ashamed to commit it. Now let's bring it right home. Are you ready? Here we go. Are you pondering a sin right now? Is there someone you're finding more attractive than your spouse? Young people, are you being tempted to cheat to get a better grade? Is there something at work that you'd like to have for yourself? Taxes are coming up next month. Are you pondering ways that you can cheat the government? That's a sin of a high hand. Where you ponder in advance. You think about it. You mull it over. Is that something that happens all of a sudden? You're caught in a moment and, and your weakness causes you to stumble. No, it's something that you have thought about. You have weighed you have deliberated over, you've planned it, you've considered it and waited. Beware the sin of the high hand. You don't want to be like Satan, who's uh, described by John Milton in his Paradise Lost. John Milton, the writer, has Satan saying, Evil, be thou my good. Satan, who lived at the right hand of the Father, he knew what was good, he knew what was right. But somewhere along the way, Satan decided, evil, you be my good. He thought about it. He pondered it. He considered it. And when you ponder it and weigh it and think about it, and you replace God's word with your own dealings, your own distorted thoughts, that's the sin of the high hand. And even David prayed. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Beware the sin of the high hand. If you're considering it, if you're thinking about it, if you're pondering it, you run home today as fast as you can, and you go to your emergency praying spot, and you get down on your hands and knees, and you beg God for mercy. If you have to quit your job, you quit your job. You have to drop out of school, you drop out of school. Whatever you have to do to stop the thought, the pondering, the considering, the weighing, you end it. Because not only is the committing of the sin a sin, but it is a sin of the high hand. Okay, that's enough for going deep. Come on back up. Let's go to verse 25. Verse 25. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And Jesus said to him, You have said it. Judas already knew the answer, but the eleven, the others, they're all asking, Is it I, is it I? And so he knew if he didn't ask, he'd be betrayed. And so he probably wants to know if Jesus knows. He's testing the water a little bit. We know he's close because he dips in the bowl with Jesus. So we know he's close by. And so you can almost see him leaning over and saying, Master, is it I? Am I the one? And Jesus, right close to him here, says, you have said it. Now, the travesty is that Judas already has the blood money with him. May I repeat myself and say, beware the sin of the high hand? May I say that again? Now, as we contemplate the sin of Judas Iscariot, 
I, I beg you, I, I wish I could get down on bended knee over here and say, I want to I want to beg you to listen to his story with a humble heart. Don't, don't you ever look at another person's sin with a better than thou attitude. Don't you ever say, look at what he did. Look at that. Look. I would never do that. Don't you ever do that. We are not in the business of making self-righteous legalists. Never forget that we are weak. That you could commit the sin Judas Iscariot committed. That every sin that has ever been committed, the root, as I preached last Sunday, the root of it is in you. That our strength is only in God. That we live the whole Christian life with two sides of the same coin. Distrusting self, trusting God. You always distrust yourself. You never think that you have enough ability or enough strength to live the Christian life. The greatest, our, our favorite stories in the Bible. Some of the, some of the favorite ones are stories where a person knew they didn't have it. They knew they didn't have it together. You remember the centurion in Capernaum, Jesus' hometown, and the Jewish leaders came. The centurion's the servant was very sick, and the leaders came, and they said, you need to go heal this man's servant because he's worthy. He is worthy. He built our synagogue. He paid for it. He's a pagan, but he paid for all our stuff. And so Jesus takes off, and the centurion sent word and said, no, 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 no. I am unworthy. Did you see, the, see it? They said he was worthy. He said, no, I'm, I'm unworthy. And Jesus was so impressed, and he healed the man's servant. What did Paul, the apostle, say? Even after having written books of the Bible, he said, I know in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. What did the prodigal son say? What did he rehearse? What did he say? He was going to say over and over again to his father. You can see him going home, and you can almost hear him saying it over and over again. I am not worthy to be called your son. I'm not worthy to be called your son. You can almost hear him practicing. What about the man? who had this son who was a demoniac, possessed with an evil spirit. And Jesus is about to heal him and said, do you believe what the father said? Do you remember? I believe. Help my unbelief. He wanted to believe, but he knew. He knew inside his deepest heart there was something wrong with him. Help, help me. Help me believe more. And that beautiful story of the tax collector, the Pharisee, his hands lifted up, thanking God I'm not like this tax collector over here. That I'm not like him. And the poor tax collector beating his chest. And he said, oh God, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that is the man that went home justified. You must spend your whole life doubting yourself. It is the total opposite of our culture and what our country says, be strong, be yourself, you've got it in you, you can make it. No, no, no. You can learn from the germination of a seed. When a seed is planted in the ground, it does two things. It puts a root down and puts a stalk up. If the plant doesn't do both, it will not live. The root goes down, the stalk goes up. The same is true for us. The seed, the essential root is self-distrust. We never trust ourselves. And the stalk is that we always trust God. Charles Wesley, the great songwriter, Charles Wesley one time said, I am weak, but confident in self-despair. He was not saying, I am weak, but I'm confident even though I'm in self-despair, he was saying, I am weak, but I am confident because I am in self-despair. Because I know I cannot do this. Because I know this is impossible for me. Because it is hopeless in my flesh. Because of that, as I hit the ground in absolute helplessness and hopelessness, I'm confident. Because that has to happen for me to have the power of God in my life. You spend your whole life distrusting yourself. You never become a stronger Christian, ever. 
Never one time in your life do you become a stronger Christian. You live your whole life broken, knowing you have to trust the Lord. You're no stronger in the Lord than you were the first moment you got saved. There is nothing in your flesh, no good thing, as Paul said. Paul, the apostle himself, was afraid he'd shipwreck his own faith after having served the God all of those years. You must always spend your life, you spend your whole life distrusting yourself. I cannot do this. I am not able. I do not have strength. I'm no stronger than I was 10 years ago. It's just me here, broken before you, Lord. You've got to do something in me. John Bunyan. In Pilgrim's Progress. Every Christian ought to read Pilgrim's Progress. It's a tough read, but it's everybody, every Christian should read Pilgrim's Progress. It's a story of Christian, a man named Christian, trying to make it to heaven. He meets his friends, hopeful and evangelist, and they're on their way to the celestial city to heaven. Right at the end, the last paragraph of Pilgrim's Progress. Christian has made it into heaven, into the celestial city, and he's rejoicing and celebrating but he turns around, and he sees coming up toward heaven, ignorance, a man named Ignorance, who has tried the wrong way to get there. And sure enough, at the last minute, Ignorance comes up to heaven, and they ask him if he has his credentials, he's been saved, no. And so they point him over to a door, and right next to the door of heaven is a door to hell, and Ignorance is escorted into the door to hell. Now, John Bunyan's not saying you can lose your salvation. What he was saying was, you can live your whole life trusting yourself, doing things your way, thinking you're somebody, thinking you're strong, being ignorant. And then when you finally come to a critical day when you really need God's help, you fall miserably into sin. Don't, don't ever trust yourself, ever. Don't, even dis don't ever trust your past. Don't ever trust your church membership. Don't ever trust anything, no matter how long you serve the Lord, you trust nothing. But down on your face before God, you say, Lord, here I am before you. I am a sinner saved by grace. I have no power in me. There's no strength in me. There's nothing in me. Here I come for the 10,000th time. And I say to you, do in me what you've done before. It's the only way to win. All right, verse 26. You're not listening fast enough today. I can tell that you lost an hour of sleep. Come on, wake up a little bit. Let's go. Think, a little, uh, think quicker and, and listen quicker. Let's go to verse 26. Verse 26. Don't, don't leave me now because now we're going to start talking about the Lord's Supper. Verse 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed. We'll stop right there for this morning. They were having the Passover, celebrating Israel's deliverance from Egypt. And while they're doing that, Jesus changed two things, as I told you, changed two things in the Passover, and those two changes are our Lord's Supper, because now they're going to celebrate not deliverance from Egypt, but deliverance from sin, which is an even worse oppression. And the meal, of course, is a memorial to his death. He's going to die, and it pictures how we appropriate his benefits. And so he began by blessing, not blessing the food. <laughs> Technically, we don't bless the food. We bless God for the food. But that's neither here nor there. If you have a problem with that, talk to Pastor Devin or Pastor Gary. They can help you with that. <laughs> we bless God for the food. The prayer that we offer before a meal fulfills at least three purposes. There are three things that are going on here when you thank the Lord for your food. Number one, you're invoking God's blessing on the food, asking Him to use it in a way that will help the one who's eating. My father-in-law, he got, he got it. Perfect. My father-in-law's meal prayer was, bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies for your service. That's it. God, you bless and use this food so that I can serve you better. That's number one. Number two, the second thing you do when you pray before a meal you thank him for the food. I, I grew up, uh, our family said the same grace at each meal as I was growing up, said it, same one. Many of you said it. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for the food, period. Start new sentence. By thy hands we all are fed. Thank you, Lord, for daily bread. Amen. And you are thanking him for the food and every other blessing of life, which leads me to number three. When you offer thanks before a meal, 
You are saying to God, you know you do not deserve it. If you're thanking Him, if you're, you're saying, I didn't earn this, you're thanking Him for the food and all the blessings of life, we realize that He is the giver of all gifts and He gives out of His kindness. That's why it's called saying grace. We are saying, we know we do not deserve this. We thank you. Now, my family has an interesting heritage about me at prayer before meals. And by the way, Ruthie and I still pray before meals, restaurants, wherever, it doesn't matter. We always pray before meals. And we say to a server, we try. Don't all the time I try to say to the server, what's your name? Oh, Diane. Diane, I'm a pastor. I'm going to pray. We're going to thank God for the food. And I'm going to pray you have a good day. And then we give a huge tip. May your teeth rot in your mouth. If the server knows you're a believer and you don't give the 20 or 25 or 30 percent tip. It's criminal if you go through a whole meal with a server and they don't know you're a Christian. You can say something like, yeah, we, saw, we heard that in church the other day. Yeah, yeah, we go to church. And then you need to give them the largest tip they've ever gotten. That's how you win people to Jesus, folks. Your food is near as important as the soul of the person who's serving you. That was free. I'm not charging you for that. Okay. My daddy was one of 13 children. And so my grandfather, 13 kids. Can you imagine such a thing? 13 children. My grandfather had to quit saying, in Jesus' name, amen. At the end of his prayer, because when he started saying, in G, right then, pandemonium broke loose as they dove for the food on the table. So Grandpa would just be going along praying, and all of a sudden say, Amen. And then they'd dive into the food. He felt it was disrespectful, so he didn't want his kids to be disrespectful. My mother's people, here's one for you. My mother's people said the prayer at the end of the meal. You had to stay at the table till grace was said at the end. My grandpa Hill, there was a verse in Deuteronomy that says, after you have entered the land and eaten thereof, then you will bless the Lord. Which has nothing to do with the meal before you... <laughs> it's totally out of context. But anyway, he thought that that said, well, after we eat, we should thank the Lord. And so you'd eat, and then you'd sit there and wait till he got done praying, and then you were dismissed. Now, it is praying before meals that first caught my eye about Ruthie. We were in college together. And while the rest of us college students were at ANW Root Beer tearing into our food like pigs, by the way, pigs still don't say grace before a meal, I noticed that one of us was always taking a moment to pray silently. I just started noticing it. I, would, I got to where, well, I'm just going to kind of look for it. Sure enough, we'd go out, and we'd all be tearing into our food, and I'd look out of the corner of my eye, and there was one, one who was praying. I started looking at her every day. I still look at her every day. I liked what I saw then physically and spiritually, and I like today what I see physically and spiritually. But it was saying grace that first caused me to begin to fall in love with Ruth. So to me, this matters. And even more important, what I said about the waitress, your food and your extra 2 or $3 is nothing compared to the soul of the person who's serving you at the table. You make sure they know you're a Christian, somehow or another. You can do it. You don't have to. I'm, not saying, I'm not saying be ugly. I'm just saying there's some way you can let it be known. You pray, and you give the largest tip they've ever gotten. Jesus only gave us two ordinances. He gave us baptism and the Lord's Supper. It is interesting that both of them highlight what we love the most about Jesus, and that's his death. When you're baptized, you stand in the water, you say you're picturing the death of Jesus being crucified. He was buried and rose again that I might give up an old life and take a new life. In the Lord's Supper, you're taking his bread and his juice, remembering that, that his body was broken for you and, your, and his blood was shed for you. It is interesting. We love his tender words. We love his wisdom. We love he's born of a virgin. We love his sinless life. We love his miracles. But there's only two, there's only one thing that two ordinances signify, and that's his death. The most important moment 
Ruthie has taught me this all through the years. She thanks Jesus for the cross constantly. Always. She reminds me, it is for the cross we must be grateful. And I've told you, she has told me many times through the years, when you get to heaven, I'll be on my face at his feet saying, thank you for the cross. I've said for many years, if the Lord were to say to me, if an angel were to land right here on his shoulder and whisper in my ear, John, you are never to preach on anything again as long as you live, except the cross. I would lift both of my hands to heaven, and I would shout out loud, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I would preach on it every Sunday until I die. Now, the fact that he used bread as one of the symbols, the only purpose of bread is to help us. You don't put bread on the wall and make something pretty out of it. You don't talk about bread. You don't honor bread. The only purpose of bread is to help people who take it. And so when Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, when Jesus said, take this bread, it was his way of saying, I want you always to remember I was God. I am God and God is spirit. But God had a problem here. God had to find a way to die. That's a real dilemma. God had to find a way to die. So just like you take bread and it's a substance that helps you and blesses you, and benefits you, and strengthens you. Jesus was saying, I took on a form, a substance I took on a material that you, that so I could do something to bless you. And that's what we remember in the Lord's Supper. He took on something. And then also, remember this. Bread that is not eaten is wasted if you do not receive the Lord Jesus. And what he did for us on the cross, if you do not accept it, it's like wasted bread that becomes boldy and is thrown out. The cross, if not appropriated, if not applied to our lives, is useless and wasted for us. All right. Oh, my Lord, help me. That's enough for today. We're done. Bow your heads. Bow your heads. Put all your notes away. Close your eyes and listen very closely to me now. Put all your notes away. Be very quiet and listen to me very carefully right now. Now I'm going to ask you. Have you appropriated what Jesus did at the cross? The only purpose of bread is you take it in. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The only purpose, he, why, did he become, why did he take flesh? The flesh is bread. Why, why did he do that? So, so we could be saved, so we could have life, so his body could be broken for us. Have you appropriated the bread? Have you taken Jesus into your heart? Have you taking him into your life. It is the only question you have to answer with regard to eternity. Do you know Jesus? If not, I'd like to lead you in a prayer. And if this prayer will help you, it doesn't save you, there's no magic in the words, no. But maybe somebody said something this week, it says, I'm ready now. Maybe some, there's something in the music, that beautiful song we sang at the end, maybe something in that. Maybe something in the message, you never know, something was said, and now you're ready. You've waited. Now it's time. This prayer will not save you. There's no magic. We don't, believe in, we don't believe in abracadabra or open sesame. We don't believe in that. But if the words actually say what you want to say, if they are a true expression of yourself, then use them. Let them be a part of this moment of receiving Jesus. And if you'd like to know Jesus, let me lead you in a prayer. Here it is. Phrase by phrase. I'll say it out loud to you. Repeat it silently. Dear Jesus, I am sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. Come live in my heart. I receive you as the master of my life. Amen. All right, everyone, would you look right here at me? All eyes fastened on pastor. If you receive the Lord, the Bible says the first thing you're supposed to do is let it be known. 
That's what baptism is about. We'd love to talk to you about being baptized. Maybe you want to join our church. Maybe you want to just come kneel and pray. So whatever decision you need to make. Maybe you want more information. Come. This is a part of the service where we just.